Stephen, and in particular for hosting this evening. Isn't it great that we have this public <coughs> space in Belfast to come together to talk about the maritime heritage in the actual Titanic quarter? So my name is Aidan McMichael. I'm vice chair, uh, sorry, co-chair of Belfast Titanic Society. And I just wanted to say a couple of words on behalf of the Belfast Titanic Society. First of all, to welcome you. Um, uh, Stephen's right insofar as this is the third um, talk by Mark here in Prony as part of the Belfast Titanic Society program. And I was just look at, looking at his talk there over Stephen's shoulder, you know, we've reached the limit. Well, I don't think we have reached the limit with uh, Mark, and I just spoke to him before the talk this evening, and he has agreed that we could do something next year. So if you enjoy tonight's talk, and maybe you've been to a few before, you'll be back next September, all being well. So just a quick word then on who the Belfast Titanic Society are. We were formed at a meeting in the Linden Hall Library in Belfast in May 1992, so we're about 27, coming on 28 years old. And at the first meeting, it was all about the people who uh, were from the Harland and Wolf environment, and also the relatives who were associated with the story of Titanic. And we know a lot of those have now passed. Um, there were also you know, relatives of people who have been uh, president of the Belfast Titanic Society. And our current president is Susie Miller, who is great-granddaughter of uh, Tommy Miller, who was lost in Titanic and is memorialized at the uh, Belfast City Hall in the Belfast Memorial, um, in the Titanic Memorial Gardens. Uh, we're unique in that we're one of the only societies in the world that meets regularly. We have talks every month. Um, this is the, the little bit of promotion that I can do, and if you're interested in the Titanic story and the wider ships of the White Star Line and the maritime history of Belfast, you're very welcome to come along. And um, Early in the 1990s, we were instrumental in lobbying the wider Belfast community, I suppose, and social partners for a more permanent way of marking the story of Titanic and Belfast, and we know the result of that is Titanic Belfast and the growth and development of uh, the Titanic Quarter. Um, we work with many partners, not least Prony, um, Titanic Foundation, Titanic Belfast and Belfast City Council, to do stuff in the Titanic space, and this is part of what we do. Um, we bring a varied and interesting program of talks and tours each year, so we're just launching tonight with our first of our annual program. And if you go onto our website, www.belfasttitanic.com, you'll find our annual program, and you're very welcome to come along. Um, so those of you that are members, we do have some current magazines that you will be due as part of your package at the back, and if you haven't received one, do go to the back and lift one, and there's others that are for sale if you're interested, uh, if you're a visitor tonight. We're absolutely delighted to be working again with Brony to bring Mark here tonight, and I just thought I would say a few things about Mark, and I told him earlier that I had mentioned a few of these things last year, but I'm going to foreshorten it because we really do want to stick to time. But he really is uh, one of the most prolific writers in the White Star line and the Olympic class area. Um, the scale of uh, the books that he has published uh, is phenomenal. I'm going to mention some. But I just thought I would give you a quote from Mark himself. So this is what Mark himself said. Titanic is the most famous ship in history, apart from Noah's Ark. <laughs> from, for the White Star Line, the building of the Olympic class represented considerable investment. The company decided to spend more money on the three Olympic ships than the entire value of the rest of their fleet as it stood in 1908. And this is the insight that um, Mark brings to his talks. The project constructing Olympic and then Titanic and then Britan Britannic, Mark says, was enormous. And by way of comparison, the, the previous big four, the Celtic, the Baltic, Adriatic and the Cedric, together their engine power wasn't as powerful as the Olympics. So the story of the Olympic class was one of triumph and tragedy, so we're going to hear this tonight. So I mentioned the, the scale of the number of books um, on the Oceanic, the Big Four, the Hawk, the, uh, if you know the story, the collision with Titanic and the Solent, and um, Olympic, the Olympic class ships, Aquitania, Majestic, uh, Olympic, Titanic sister, stretching back there to the early 2000s. And he's been a major contributor to uh, other major authors, such as Beveridge, uh, who wrote The Olympic and Titanic, along with other co-authors. Kant, 
who wrote the Atlantic Liners, to Admiral Jellico, who wrote the Grand Fleet. So the, the books go on and on, Mark. So there's a um, good uh, number of books that you've written. I think it's time to hear from Mark. We'll just try and keep to time. That's all I wanted to say. And again, just you're all very welcome. And um, there probably will still be a few people coming in because we know that tonight's was quite booked out. So, uh, Mark, do you want to start us off then? So, we welcome Mark. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is water, not vodka. I did, I did ask. Um, right, well, thanks for the warm welcome. I appreciate it. And um, thanks for all coming. Um, and thanks for staying, if you do. And um, we've got quite a few familiar faces, so I'm even more grateful to you for coming back. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about Titanic, but really I'm talking about all three Olympic-class ships. And I'm trying to cover just a few different angles which maybe haven't been covered in that much detail before. So we always hear about there are the biggest ships in the world and so on, and you know, this um, advance in engineering. Um, but actually, we don't necessarily hear of all the details, all of the problems that they had to overcome. So how you finance ships this big, how you insure them, um, all the problems they had with uh, the ports and um, how they had to make them ready for, for ships this size. Um, so the, the opening quote, we have reached the limit, that is actually from a German uh, shipping company uh, manager, in general manager in New York in 1907. And the full version is he's basically saying we've reached the limit of ship development with our current facilities. So... Um, it's very much that every time they build another ship, they're very much pushing up against um, the limit of what's, uh, what's possible. Uh, okay, so um, we open up in uh, 1907, so White Star Line had uh, moved their um, express service to uh, Southampton, and um, Aidan alluded to this earlier, but um, in 1908, so the following year, White Star had 23 ships, and um, their entire fleet was valued at 4.85 million pounds. And in building the three Olympic-class ships, it represented an investment of 5.3 million pounds. So it just puts into perspective the amount of money that they were spending on these ships. Um, okay, so um, 1907, White Star and Hind and Wolf agreed a payment schedule. So, right from the start, the moment the ship's keel is laid, White Star has to start paying Harland and Wolf. So they pay when the keel's laid, when the double bottom's completed, when the hull plating is completed, and so on. So, right from the start, they're sending considerable sums of money to the shipbuilder Harland and Wolf. And this is all before the ships are completed and are earning money for the company. So, um, something that Bruce Ismay said, so he was the chairman of the White Star Line, and he said, um, Hand and Wolf have carte blanche to build the ship and put everything of the very best into that ship. And after they have spent all the money they can on her, they add on their commission to the gross cost of the ship, which we pay them. So basically, Hand and Wolf build the ship, whatever it costs, it costs, and then they add on 4 or 5%. So Hand and Wolf as a shipbuilder are guaranteed a profit. And you could argue that because it's a fixed percentage, the more money they spend, then uh, the more incentive there is, um, because that four or five percent is of a greater um, sum of money. And um, Harland and Wolf and White Star had a very close um, working relationship. Um, other shipping lines were a bit critical of the arrangement, precisely because they thought. It, it's a, literally a blank check to the shipbuilder, and they thought that the shipbuilder would um, would mount up the cost. Okay, so um, one of the things that uh, Ismay said was that when you start building a ship, you have to start planning a good few years before you actually need her. And um, 
this was really um, the case in 1907-1908 when uh, the Olympics were uh, being planned. And um, what you can see here from the arrow is that in 1908, White Star Line's profits went down quite considerably because there was a trade depression. Um, so that's good and bad. Um, it's good because it's a good time to invest in new tonnage because when the upturn comes, you've got these brand new ships that can take advantage of that. The downside is that you're um, planning these ships at a time when uh, you're making less money. So um, it poses something of a, of a challenge from a, a financial um, standpoint. Um, now the White Star Line um, started out as a British company, but um, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, 1902 it became part of a big American combine, IMM, and um, essentially the uh, White Star shareholders um, they were paid. Um, a very good price to part with their shares, and uh, White Star became part of this huge American combine. Now, um, one of those popular myths is that J.P. Morgan, the famous banker, financed uh, construction of Titanic. Um, you see it in lots of books. Um, this is simply wrong. Um, it's on Wikipedia as well, but it's still wrong. Um, and um, it, it, We'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see why that's not the case. Um, but this great big combine, IMM, it was actually what they call overcapitalized. They had too much money. And you might think, well, that's a nice problem to have. Um, but in this sense, it's not, because the extra capital they've got is debt. It's money that they've borrowed from people, money that they have to pay back. Um, and it basically turned out that IMM had paid too much money for all the shipping assets they acquired. So they had all these debt payments they had to make and um, less in terms of earnings to, uh, to meet them. Um, and there's a little last graph, I, uh, I promise. Um, again, you can just see every couple of years shipping trade undergoes a bit of a downturn. And you can see the two arrows, 1904, 1908, the black line is the net earnings of this big shipping combine, which includes White Star. And the red line is the interest payments on their debt. And um, you can basically see that 1904-1908, their profits are less than the interest on their debt. So actually, it's, uh, it's very much the other way around. It's White Star that will have to finance these ships, not IMM. Um, because IMM was not earning enough money to cover its debt payments, investors holding their bonds started to sell them. Prices went down and the yields went up. So basically the borrowing costs went up um, because investors didn't feel that they were credit worthy. And as a result of that, they took the decision that White Star would fund um, construction of these ships. Okay, yeah, and here's the, here's the proof. Um, so notwithstanding Wikipedia, this is a document, uh, it's a prospectus that was issued for investors and um, they uh, put money into these uh, bonds that were issued by the uh, White Star Line. And um, the important point here, if you look at this figure where the arrow is, it, it, they're basically selling for more than £97, and these are bonds that are going to be redeemed at about £100 at the, uh, at the end of it. And um, the reason that White Star issued the bonds was because they were able to get very close to £100 for each bond. The problem with IMM was that because their bonds were trading at low prices, uh, I think it was something like 70 cents on the dollar. So do you want to sell bonds at the equivalent of 70p in the pound, or 70 cents on a dollar, or do you want to sell them for nearly 100? So White Star was seen as more credit worthy, and um, that's why White Star issued these bonds. And um, the buyers of these bonds, the investors, were almost all, we believe, um, United Kingdom investors. So again, American money doesn't really um, come into it. There was another benefit as well, because White Star has borrowed this money to, to finance these ships, and um, the value of the ships, 
when they're completed is going to be more than the money they've borrowed on the bonds, so that the rest is met from profits. So basically, this extra property is added to the security of the bonds um, for IMM. So essentially, it makes IMM a bit more credit worthy. Uh, okay, so you're spending all this money, you want to make sure you've got a return on it. Um, it's very difficult to estimate how much money um, these ships were expected to earn, but we've got a reasonable estimate of uh, Olympic in 1911. Um, it's actually a newspaper account, it said between 25 and 35,000 pounds per round voyage. Um, you can convert it in all sorts of ways to modern money, but it's safe to say it was a lot. Um, and uh, we have evidence from other ships. Um, Mauritania, so probably Olympic's nearest rival in 1911, was earning about 19,000 per voyage. And um, we've got a Cunard ship, Aquitania, was earning about 33,000 in uh, 1914. So I think it's a, a reasonable estimate. And um, basically on a gross basis, it'll take roughly five years um, for them to, to recoup their, their funds. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the complete result. So this is Olympic coming into New York in 1911. Um, it's one of my favorite photos. I think the photographer um, had, a, had a good eye for a picture. But um, just in keeping with the ship, I mean, she's the longest ship in the world, the biggest ship in the world, and you can just see he's missed off a bit of the stern. So uh, it hasn't quite uh, been able to, uh, to get it all in shot. Um, okay, so having built these ships and they're earning money, there's also the issue of insurance because you can't really go to a single insurance company to uh, insure these <coughs> ships. Um, it, it's a huge risk, um, even if they are believed to be unsinkable. Um, so uh, White Star was very strict. They issued instructions to their captains and they said, we remind you that the steamers are to a great extent uninsured. So they told the commanders that their own success, sorry, their own livelihood, as well as the company's success, depends upon immunity from accident. No precaution which can, sorry, no precaution which ensures safe navigation is to be considered excessive. Um, and obviously it doesn't always work, as uh, the captain of the Titanic uh, demonstrated. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, Part of their procedure was to put some of their profits aside each year, just had their own insurance fund. Uh, Cunard did it, White Star did it, and um, it seems to have been fairly common um, practice for the various shipping lines. Um, after 1902, White Star has been absorbed into this big shipping combine, IMM. IMM had its own insurance fund, um, and again, White Star contributed to it. So, if we take Titanic as the example, because she's the, uh, she's the obvious one, um, she was insured for one year, end of March 1912. It was an American insurance broker, Willis, Faber and Co. And they had to spread the risk between a, a big consortium of different insurance companies. So they went to Lloyd's of London, and um, I forget the exact number, but there was quite a large number of companies that took a small chunk of the risk each so that it was manageable altogether. And um, they insured the ship for one million pounds, uh, which actually was a fair bit short of her cost, because she's believed to have cost a bit over one and a half million pounds. So uh, there's, a, there's a gap there in the unlikely event that uh, the ship uh, is gonna meet with a, an accident and, and uh, be lost. Um, and this, uh, this didn't go unnoticed, so um, Cunard had been running Lusitania and Mauritania for a couple of years. They um, entered service 1907, and uh, they were very large ships. They were 31,000 gross tons, but uh, Olympic and Titanic were 45 and 46,000 tons. So you can see that the White Star ships are a fair bit bigger than the uh, Cunarders. Um, but uh, there was also a German shipping company, um, which I'll, I'll shorten to HAPAD, because I can't quite remember what it stands for, but um, also called the Hamburg America Line. 
and um, the uh, head of the Hamburg America line wrote to Bruce Ismay in February 1912, and he said, do you not think that the companies which own these large ships of the Olympic and the Mauritania type might agree upon an insurance arrangement calculated to reduce the expenses by some mutual arrangement? So these shipping lines, they're, they're fierce rivals in that sense, but at the same time where there's um, some potential for mutual uh, uh, beneficial uh, cooperation, then that's uh, something that they look at as well. And after getting this letter from uh, Albert Ballin of the uh, Hamburg America line, uh, Ismay approached uh, uh, Mr. Booth, who was the head of uh, Cunard effectively in 1912, and um, he said, what do you think of the proposal? And uh, Booth uh, responded, um, and he said um, that Cunard carried a larger total loss risk than they at all care about. Basically, they were underinsuring the ships because they didn't uh, want to, to meet the huge insurance uh, premiums. And uh, after a few uh, initial discussions, uh, they were uh, quite amenable to the idea that they should have this mutual arrangement uh, that will benefit all of them. And um, Ismay uh, writes back to uh, Albert Ballin, uh, the German company, and um, he says, we can discuss it sometime in May. And he writes a letter to him and it says, my daughter is going to be married on the 21st of March, 1912. We shall have to defer our discussion until sometime in May, as it's my intention, all being well, to make the first voyage on the Titanic, leaving Southampton on the 10th of April, being due back on the 27th. Um, and of course, it, it, it sounds like a silly point, but it just brings home to you that we know what happened next and they didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, these uh, discussions about coming to an arrangement on the insurance were postponed till uh, what turned out to be after the Titanic disaster. Um, uh, one of the curious things when Titanic uh, was first reported as being in trouble um, were that the uh, reinsurance rates spiked on the insurance market and there was something as high as 60%. So for every 100 pounds you want to uh, insure, you're basically paying 60 quid for the privilege, which is just not worth it really. Um, and um, actually in July 1912, uh, there are still some concerns about this, the, the fact that insurance companies have just reassessed um, how risky these big ships are. And um, Ismay writes to an insurance broker, and uh, he says, You know the difficulties there are in the way of placing insurance on steamers of very high value, and no doubt this will be increased owing to the unfortunate loss of the Titanic. Um, a bit of an understatement, really. <laughs> but uh, they, they persisted, um, given their due. Uh, they had these uh, discussions throughout 1912 into 1913. So this was Cunard and White Star, both British companies and fierce rivals, um, and uh, the Hamburg America line. And um, Cunard confirmed in 1913 that they'd entered into an arrangement with White Star and Hamburg America uh, for the mutual insurance of a portion of the risks on vessels of very high value belonging to the three companies. So uh, basically, they managed to reduce the, uh, the cost of uh, insurance. Um, so, you might think that they'd solved the problem for a while, but of course, 1914 comes around, and there's a reference in the 1914 annual report that the arrangement had been terminated. Uh, for obvious reasons, the German uh, shipping company wasn't, uh, wasn't involved anymore. So, uh, that short-lived example of uh, cooperation uh, came, uh, came to an end. Um, so, those were some of the challenges in terms of financing these ships, insuring them, and um, the issues that uh, White Star were faced with. But there are also the engineering issues, and uh, we can start really with Harland and Wolf and the problems they faced uh, building ships this large. Um, Harland and Wolf's uh, development didn't always go to plan. Um, in 1905, Thomas Andrews, who certainly played a role in the design of the Olympic and the Titanic, but was not the chief designer, 
um, contrary to what it says on Wikipedia, um, wrote to his mother, and um, this was in connection with Holland and Wolf expanding, because the, the shipyard was very profitable, very successful. And he said to his mother, I suppose you were surprised to see we have bought a yard on the River Clyde. I'll be interested to see what the Belfast newspapers will say and how the Harbour Board will explain away us extending our business outside Belfast. Um, well, as I have repeatedly said, they have only themselves to blame. The pity is the ratepayers don't know how their interests are being abused by a narrow-minded lot of old women, the one half of them being too conceited in their own importance and the other half too jealous to manage a rag store. They prefer to keep their land lying as slap land rather than allow it to be developed in the interests of the port. Um, so uh, the tone's somewhat at odds with his uh, public speeches, but um, yeah, fortunately he set that down. Beautiful, neat handwriting and a letter to his mom. So it gives, some, it gives us some idea of his thoughts um, on the subject. Um, now, fortunately, as it would have it, Harland and Wolfe had signed a contract in 1903, so a few years before these ships were ordered, uh, for what would become the biggest dry dock in the world. So work began in 1904. It was 300,000 cubic yards of sand and clay that were excavated. 76,000 cubic yards of concrete were used. Uh, 24,000 cubic yards of brickwork. 26,000 cubic yards of cut granite. And you could really go on and just drown people in figures, but it's really quite remarkable um, the, uh, the effort that was involved. Um, okay, so um, I appreciate, it's not the clearest of drawings, and I hope you can uh, see it at the back, um, but what we can see in the middle here, this U-shape is meant to represent the Olympic, and uh, within that we've got uh, the top um, the three lower lines of writing, we've got the top one is a graving dock from uh, 1826, then uh, the next one is the Hamilton graving dock from 1897, and then the Alexandra graving dock from 1889. Um, and what we can see right at the bottom is the basin for the new uh, graving dock, which came to be known as the Thompson graving dock, it wasn't called that till 1915. So it just shows some illustration about um, uh, just how large um, the new dock was compared to the uh, compared to the old one, and uh, uh, the original contract, the dock was meant to be completed in three years and four months. Didn't go to plan. There was a serious subsidence in the graving dock alongside it, um, and uh, the dock ended up being 96 feet wide at the entrance. Uh, and then 100 feet wide on the dock floor, 850 feet long. And um, you could also extend the dock um, because the outer gate could just be uh, um, extended, um, extending the dock floor to uh, just under 890 feet. And the idea at the time was that this dock would be really big, it would serve all their needs for years to come, and by the time the dock is completed in 1911, it's only just big enough for Olympic to fit in. So straight away, they're then having to think, well, do we need to enlarge it um, for a few ships just down the, down the line? And um, Britannic, so the, the sister ship of Olympic and Titanic, was 94 feet wide compared to 92 and a half feet for Olympic and Titanic. And um, she was a really, really tight squeeze getting her in there. Um, so. Um, it, it, was, it was fortunate, really, that in 1903 they were so far-sighted, because uh, otherwise they'd have, uh, they'd have been in trouble. And uh, just, just as a matter of interest, there were three pumping engines, and these pumping engines were a thousand horsepower each, and it took one hour forty minutes just to pump the dock dry once you've got the ship in there. And um, apparently... Uh, I don't know if this story is true or not, but it's a story I've heard. Naturally, you get quite a few fish trapped in the dry dock once you've shut the gate. So when you pump it out, you've got a fair few fish on the dock floor, and apparently they were a popular snack with, uh, with the shipyard workers. I don't know if that was officially sanctioned. 
Um, okay, so uh, having a dry dock is only part of it. Actually, there's a whole complex series of calculations you need to undertake when you're uh, dry docking a large ship. This is the same for every large ship, really, but particularly important for ships like Olympic. Uh, this diagram is actually part of the docking plan from 1924. Um, it's not the best quality, and actually it's the only one I've got. Um, but uh, you can just see, basically, they, they mark out very carefully um, where um, the ship should be supported. So you can see at the bottom, they just mark out the keel block should be spaced um, however many feet apart in the centre. So just to make sure that once the ship is in dry dock, it's appropriately supported and they've got the, the necessary uh, 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 blocks uh, everywhere. Okay, so uh, this is a cross-section uh, through Olympic, so this is actually, uh, yeah, number three boiler room. Um, and although it's from 1929, it, it's of course representative of 1911 as well, essentially. Um, you can see really the ship's very rectangular, it's got a, a flat, uh, pretty flat bottom. There's a, a slight curve at the, uh, the turn of the bilge, um, but nothing, uh, nothing too uh, much compared to uh, certain earlier ships. Um, and uh, we can just see here uh, a photo of the uh, uh, completed uh, dry dock in 1911, and Olympics there in the background with only three funnels. They're just about to put the fourth one on, and then uh, shortly afterwards she's going to be uh, in the dry dock as well. And um, you can see in the distance, um, that's, I think that's the end, yeah, that's the dock, that's the dock gate. Um, and if you look in the middle, you've got the raised uh, uh, row or, or line of blocks. Um, one of the things that's not widely appreciated is that when they were designing these ships originally, they proposed that they'd only dock them on a single line of keel blocks. So basically the ship would be supported in the middle and not at the sides. And because of that, they had to be very careful in designing the strength of the ship. And these ships were specifically strengthened um, transversely, so that's from side to side, just to make sure that when it was uh, dry docked with the uh, support in the middle and right under the keel, that the uh, port and the starboard sides of the ship wouldn't drop. And, uh, yeah, it was quite a big uh, event, naturally, in 1911. So, the biggest ship in the biggest dock. And um, there's quite a few photos of the occasion. You can see the crowds on each side. And there's a photographer um, a bit further along on the left. And you just got this massive towering ship. She's actually sitting um, quite high in the water. And um, quite a... Quite a tricky operation, really, getting her into the uh, dock safely. And I can imagine they breathed a sigh of relief once she was uh, safely in there. Oh, okay, so um, it's a great photo. This was taken in 2010. And um, it was uh, uh, Trevor Ferris who, uh, who took this image. Um, but I just find it remarkable that this dry dock that um, was completed in 1911. It was still in use as recently as I think 2002 or 2003. Hardenwald slash ship uh, used it. So um, for all of the uh, all of the uh, criticism, I suppose, in 1911 that the dock was only just large enough for these huge ships, actually it ended up serving its purpose for uh, decades afterwards. There's, uh, there's a fair bit more, really, I could say about Harland and Wolf, but um, we are uh, uh, pushed, for, pushed for time. Um, so, moving on to Southampton docks, because, of course, that's where these ships were going to sail from. Um, this is how the docks were in 1905. And what you can see right at the top there in the middle is essentially a whole area of land which was earmarked for future development. So you can see at the bottom you've got the River Itchen, the Outer Dock, Inner Dock, Empress Dock, um, and all the various uh, sheds in this um, light brownish colour. But uh, right up there, that is all uh, vacant space, and um, that was uh, 
space that um, was used in the end to build a, a much larger dock at Southampton to, uh, to take these ships. But of course, before they can get to the dock, they need to make sure that the river is uh, deep enough. And already in 1907, White Star had had to ask for all sorts of dredging to be done to accommodate Adriatic which was um, their largest ship before Olympic and Titanic. Um, Adriatic had to be lightly loaded on her early voyages so that she wasn't too deep in the water, so that she could actually get into the port. And um, there was some reticence to uh, get the dredging done because it, it represented an expense. Um, so White Star are aware in 1908 they've ordered these ships. These ships are much larger. They need to make sure that there's dredging done at Southampton so these ships are going to be able to use the port. Um, and in December 1908, so that's the same month that Olympic's keel is laid down at Harnden Wolf, the manager of the White Star Line at Southampton, that's Philip Curry, wrote to the uh, Harbour Board and he said, if the port of Southampton is to derive full benefit from the advent of these steamers, it must be safeguarded against any possibility of reproach or reflection upon its facilities, such as would arise were detention to be caused to the vessels in consequence of any deficiency in the draft of water in the channels and approaches to the port and docks. Um, he, uh, I've read quite a lot of his letters and he, he did believe in long, uh, long sentences. Um, so that's the initial approach to the Harbour Board at Southampton. So yeah, December 1908. Um, Throughout 1909, there are various subcommittees who debate the issue and then defer it to another subcommittee or just pass it back and forth. And um, they don't really seem to prioritise it because they're saying, oh, it will be four years, it will be about 1912 before these ships come. Um, and naturally, actually, these um, subcommittees, they want to know, well, if we do the dredging, Will these ships use Southampton for a good number of years? Because we don't want to go through all this expense and then find that you know they, they go after a couple of years or go to Liverpool. Um, are other shipping companies going to use Southampton too? They're saying, is dredging really necessary? And they get into all these debates about state of the tide and when will these ships come in? What percent of the time will they be coming in when it's uh, low water and so on? Um, so uh, they go through all this uh, minute detail and um, try to estimate, well, actually, is the work really necessary? Um, now, um, just as a bit of context, um, the docks which I showed you um, earlier are right at the top uh, left of, uh, of this map. So right at the bottom, you've got the Isle of Wight, um, you've got uh, so you can see cows, the Solent, and then if you go up, um, Southampton Water, um, you can just about see in white um, where the uh, where the docks where the docks are. Now, uh, uh, by the start of 1910, these subcommittees at Southampton were still discussing this issue of getting the dredging done, and they they basically said. We should be glad to hear what financial arrangement you would be prepared to enter into. So they say to the White Star Line, if the board provide you with 30 feet more of water, um, and um, basically could we have a loan for 55 years? <coughs> and uh, the next day, um, in January 1910, a whole delegation from White Star has to meet with the committee at Southampton. Uh, you've got the general uh, manager, Harold Sanderson, local manager at Southampton, Philip Curry. You've got Captain Haddock, uh, commander of the Oceanic. Um, I always loved that name. Cunard had a Captain Dolphin at one point as well. Um, and then, um, did I say George Bowyer, who was um, a pilot of the large uh, ships at Southampton. And um, they met with the councillor chairing the committee, and straight away the councillor says, I may say we hesitate to incur such a heavy expense because it's going to cost us £100,000 and these are only two ships. Um, Sanderson is not too impressed by this. He says, well, if Liverpool had your advantages, so he's talking about the natural advantages Southampton have, um, then if they had the chance to spend £100,000, it would make them the happiest place in Great Britain. Um, and then... 
Sanderson says that the board's proposal for White Star to help pay um, was not something he was keen on. I really think that such a novel proposal would not have been made by any other port in Great Britain. In bringing the two ships' trade to Southampton, we feel we are doing all that might be asked. Purchases for the ships would be made at Southampton. So he's arguing, well, yeah, you're spending this money, but it's all good for the local economy. And um, the councillor's not really having any of this. So he says to Sanderson, well, you mentioned about coming to Southampton, that you would do sorry, that you would do all in the interests of Southampton, but you came here in the interests of the White Star Line. And Sanderson tries to convince him at the same time, we're, we're both going to benefit if you, uh, if you do the work. Um, Sanderson makes the point that ships are getting bigger. He said, well, we're merely the forerunners. There are going to be even larger ships. And one of the councillors says, well, what's going to happen in 10 years' time if you go elsewhere? We'll have spent this money. Where are we going to stand? Um, and Samson saying, well, that's not reasonable. Where are you going to be if you don't improve the port? And there's all this, all this back and forth. And then eventually his subcommittee um, resolved unanimously that they recommend to the harbour board that they do the necessary dredging. Um, so m more than a year has passed with all this arguing, going back and forth. And um, Sanderson points out, we started with a little ship called the Oceanic, 400 feet long. We increased 10 feet at a time, um, undoubtedly a great success. Last step was a big one, and we invested three million of money. So he's basically saying, well, we're, we're progressing all the time, and um, Southampton is, uh, is going to uh, benefit from that. Okay, so um, in the end, the Harbour Board itself approves the recommendation. They agree for the dredging. Um, then these arguments come back and forth. So um, part of um, Southampton Docks is covered by uh, London South Western Railway Company. And they uh, were anxious that the Harbour Board should bear part of the expense of, dred of the dredging. Um, and the Harbour Board was saying, well, actually, it's, it's not our liability, it's up to the railway company. So again, all these arguments just going back and forth. Uh, and in the end, it's actually only early in 1911, so just weeks before Olympic is finished, that all of these arguments are sorted out. So in the time it's taken Hond and Wolf to build the ship, they've just been talking about these improvements, who's going to pay, is it necessary? And um, from White Star's point of view, just holding things up, basically. Um, but yeah, just as a bit of context, so this is, um, on the left, the, uh, the White Star dock. It's still in use today. And you can see there with the blue upper decks, it's one of those huge modern cruise ships. Um, I think this is from 2018 or so. Um, it's fairly recently anyway. And again, I've, on the right, I've just enlarged the map a bit, so you can just see where all the red uh, balloon or whatever the markers are, um, that's where the berths are. So, again, something quite remarkable, really, because um, the dock that they've built at, uh, at Southampton um, is still in use today. So it was built for Olympic and Titanic, and um, now it's uh, used by modern ships, including Queen Mary II. So uh, this was taken in April, and um, I'm not sure of her total length. I think she's over 1,100 feet. So she's um, a good 200 feet or so longer um, than the Titanic. And she's, uh, she's still using the dock. Um, and um, the dock was uh, 1,700 feet long. And um, one engineer <coughs> quipped at the time, well, are they going to build a 1,700 foot long ship? Or is it just the case that they've got two ships 800 feet long or what have you? Um, but even Queen Mary II has not, has not, reached, uh, has not reached that length. Um, so the White Star dock itself, um, taking up all that land we saw earlier um, that was uh, reserved for development, um, was uh, also 400 feet wide uh, and uh, high water 
um, they had 53 feet of water, which was plenty, because these ships normally drew about 35 feet of water. So um, it was ample for, for what they needed. Um, altogether, they spent £750,000 on the dock and dredging. Um, you know, that's half the cost of the Titanic. Um, so again, you've got these huge sums they're having to spend, all this, all this capital investment. Um, just to provide the port facilities, and this is just at Southampton. Um, so, of course, one of the uh, passengers on Olympic's main voyage was Thomas Andrews. Um, he was on Titanic's main voyage as well, and, uh, of course, sadly, um, he was among those that were lost uh, when uh, Titanic sank. Uh, he wrote quite a few notes about all aspects of the ship and various things that they could improve. Um, but one of the things was uh, a complaint on behalf of the first-class passengers because he was saying that the uh, first-class gangway at Southampton should have been um, taking the first-class passengers onto D-deck, which is lower down than B-deck, because they used B-deck and he was saying, oh, it's too steep, the first-class passengers shouldn't have to climb um, at, that, uh, at that high angle. Um, this... This is actually just a sample from his notes elsewhere. Um, it's basically illegible, um, what he wrote uh, about the gangway. But uh, also, the London and South Western Railway were quite keen to highlight that these new docks were served by them, that the boat train came uh, right to the dock, and they said that because Olympic and Titanic were so tall, they had to make the passenger gantries extra high. So again, it's just another, another little thing that you don't necessarily realise, it's just a practical example of all the issues that they, they had to overcome. Um, so yeah, this was just Southampton. Um, New York was an issue as well. For years, the dock commissioner at New York was declining proposals to make the docks larger. And um, in 1910, White Star's rival Cunard were also thinking, well, we need to build new tonnage now because White Star are building Olympic and Titanic. And that ship that they built was Aquitania that was basically the same size. And um, Cunard's chairman says, well, there is a problem at New York with the facilities. But he said the problem of solving the pier difficulty will rest with White Star because their ships are going to enter service first. So uh, their rival, they, they just leave it to White Star to take the initiative and get it sorted out. Um, part of the issue was that the Secretary of State for War in the United States needed to give consent to um, this peer extension at New York. And um, December 1910, a representative uh, wrote to the uh, Secretary of State for War um, and uh, just trying to argue the case, really, and, and, and saying... Um, how important it was, and he said, it seems unreasonable for the government to prevent the city of New York from developing its facilities. Um, and then, according to Cunard's agent in New York, um, White Star interested J.P. Morgan in bringing all the influence he has to bear upon the government in Washington to permit some increase in the length of the piers. So uh, you've got him, I assume, lo lobbying the the Secretary of State for War. And um, they do threaten to go elsewhere. They say, actually, we don't have to go to New York. Um, complete bluff. <laughs> no one, no one uh, believed it, I don't think. Um, in the end, it was uh, referred to the Harbour Board. Um, they recommended that the piers do be, are extended by 100 feet. And this temporary extension was only authorised in March 1911. So again, you're talking about a couple of weeks before Olympic was finished. So uh, there was all this going back and forth just to get a temporary peer extension. Um, so you can see Olympic here in the middle. Um, the ship on the left, Oceanic, she was just over 700 feet long. And then uh, Olympic is uh, 882 feet or so overall. And you can just see the, the shed in the middle, um, right at the, at the bottom in the foreground, that's the, the temporary um, pier extension. So uh, it just provided that extra 
extra bit of length just to make sure that Olympic could uh, dock safely in New York so that her stern wasn't sticking out into the uh, river. Okay, um, there were issues at Queenstown as well. So um, Olympic makes her main voyage in June 1911 and um, she actually came into the inner harbour of Queenstown um, and um, uh, not sure exactly where but um, uh, one of the uh, newspapers uh, highlighted how uh, manoeuvrable um, she appeared to be actually coming, coming into the harbour. Um, it was different when Titanic was completed. She anchored off uh, uh, Roche's Point, and um, then the passengers uh, were, were taken out by tender to the ship. Um, this wasn't an ideal arrangement, because if you had bad weather conditions and so on, um, there the, the could be problems there in transferring the passengers, so that was another issue. Um, there was never really any possibility that these ships could dock at Queenstown, but they obviously did need to take on passengers. Um, White Star already had some doubts, actually, about calling at Queenstown, because Sanderson thought that there was about seven hours delay compared to if the ships had just sailed straight from Cherbourg. But of course there was um, the need to take on mails and also uh, um, particularly third-class uh, immigrant passengers. Um, just before Titanic sailed on her maiden voyage, um, White Star tried to get permission from the post office to admit the call at Queenstown, because of course there's a post office, there's a mail contract that they need to fulfill. Um, it, didn't, um, it didn't come to anything, they didn't press the issue, but um, in 1913, um, problems uh, came to light. So uh, it was uh, September 1913 um, when they actually had to leave some passengers uh, behind. So um, Sanderson, who was by then the head of the White Star Line, was on Olympic and Captain Haddock said, could you join me on the bridge? And Haddock says to him, I don't feel at all comfortable about bringing a ship this size into Queenstown Harbour. And um, Sanderson said, why? And um, Haddock explained, well, it's just not safe in terms of manoeuvring, I'm worried we'll run aground, or something of that sort. Um, and, um, you know, these were, these were reasonable uh, fears, really, but it was just an example of uh, the problems of, of having ships of this size. And um, Sanderson said to him, run no risk that you could possibly be blamed for, which um, I thought was an interesting choice of words. Um, but uh, in the end, he says, Captain Haddock, it's only a temporary matter. You brought the ship in here safely now a good many times. We're going to end this Queenstown call anyway. It's only a matter of months. I prefer not to approach the post office at the moment. So this, uh, this tricky decision is deferred. Um, and naturally, things come to a head uh, not long afterwards. Uh, so, September 1913, uh, there's about 200 passengers, I think. Um, there were certainly a few hundred that essentially were stranded at Queenstown. So the ship's captain doesn't want to enter the harbour. Um, yeah, the American spelling here, so this is the uh, New York Times. And um, the tugs are unable to come out, unable to make the transfer. So um, they had to, Olympic arrived at Queenstown at uh, nine o'clock in the morning. By noon, they had to abandon any thought of getting these passengers on board. And in the end, it was uh, nearly seven o'clock in the evening. So Olympic left for New York and left behind these hundreds of angry passengers who uh, then had to uh, find alternative uh, accommodation. Okay, so uh, finally, we've, we've looked at financing these ships, the costs of insuring them, all of the, uh, the politics and all of the issues they've had to overcome, whether it's Southampton, whether it's New York, whether it's uh, Queenstown. Um, but they also represented a big engineering challenge from the point of view 
of uh, the propelling machinery because it's widely known that these ships were not intended to be the largest in the world. They were designed for a service speed <coughs> excuse me, of uh, 21 knots with plenty of power in reserve. Um, the uh, holder of the blue ribboned Mauritania could average 26 knots, that was the record. So uh, they're not the fastest by any means, but they have got a competitive speed. But because these ships are so large, even to do 21 knots represents a big engineering challenge because Hand and Wolf are going to have to put in engines that are more powerful than uh, what they've done before. Um, and this is, a, I, I, love the, I love the script on here, um, but uh, this, uh, this is an agreement, uh, 1895, um, just a license for Hand and Wolf to use the Yarrow, Slick and Tweedy system which is um, basically a uh, way to balance the uh, reciprocating engines. So you can see them here in the middle, four cylinders, and um, this method, it, it was basically, they, they designed the engines so that the, um, the crankshafts were in a particular arrangement so that they didn't need extra, extra balancing. So it was a way to keep the engines simple so they're easy to maintain, um, and you've got these pistons driving these crankshafts, and then, of course, uh, the uh, port and starboard propellers. <coughs> now, the most powerful ship that Hand and Wolf had built for the White Star Line was Oceanic in 1899, and her engines could develop about 28,000 horsepower. Um, for Olympic and Titanic, they really needed about 46,000 horsepower to do 21 knots. So you're talking about quite a considerable uh, increase. Um, now, part of the reason that White Star didn't go for speed was just that it wasn't economically viable. So um, we've got some data from Cunard, and this is when they were designing Aquitanian, which, was, as I said earlier, was uh, uh, about the same size as Olympic and Titanic. And they calculated that the amount of horsepower you needed to do 25 knots was 2.6 times greater than what you needed to do 19 knots. So to go from 19 to 25, you might not think it's that great a leap, but actually the, the horsepower you need is just an exponential increase, really. Um, so that's part of the reason why um, it, it's just not economical. Um, and... In the end, the uh, propelling machinery that, that they designed for Olympic, Titanic and Britannic could develop about 59,000 horsepower. So it, you're talking about extremely powerful engines. Um, now these, uh, these piston engines, they were called triple expansion. So you've basically got uh, steam coming in at high pressure, you've then got an uh, intermediate pressure cylinder, and then uh, the low pressure cylinders. Um, that was the same as Oceanic, and they were basically an enlarged version of Oceanic's engines. But reciprocating engines had actually developed a bit more by 1911. You had uh, quadruple expansion <coughs> engines, which were a bit more economical. Um, and what Hand and Wolf did with Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic was adopt uh, a combination of uh, machinery. So as well as these uh, piston-based uh, reciprocating engines, they also included a low-pressure turbine. So um, this is a license that Hahn and Wolf had from uh, Parsons. Um, so Charles Parsons was um, a turbine uh, engine designer um, from uh, November 1905. And uh, as part of the preparation uh, to build Olympic, Titanic and Britannic, uh, Piri um, took a financial stake, or rather Holland and Wolf took a financial stake in John Brown, which was a shipbuilder um, on, the, uh, on the Clyde. Um, and the turbine engines for Olympic and Titanic were then subcontracted to John Brown's. So it saved uh, Holland and Wolf at that time from investing in new facilities to manufacture turbine engines themselves. Um, and uh, as you can see, 
here, you've got the turbine engine on the left, and effectively the idea was that the turbine engine would be the fourth stage of expansion. So the steam has passed through the reciprocating engines, they can't make any further use of it, and instead of going out into the condensers, actually a turbine engine working at low pressure can take this steam, which would otherwise have been wasted, and it's then used to drive the turbine and drive the centre propeller, um, because these ships were, were triple screw uh, steamers. Um, this arrangement was tested on a smaller ship, so uh, White Star's Laurentic uh, was completed um, on the 15th of April 1909, and um, her trials took place a couple of days later. And then 20th of April 1909, Harndon Wolf ordered the uh, engine works at Harndon Wolf to proceed with uh, completion of the uh, propelling machinery for Olympic and Titanic. So they were quite comfortable with the theory, and within days of Laurentic being completed and going on sea trials, they uh, proceeded with the uh, same uh, arrangement for Olympic, Titanic and Britannic. Now one of the things that's unusual about Lusitania and Mauritania, the Cunard ships, is that they were built from the bow first because they were still pending a decision on the exact form of the stern and their propelling uh, machinery. Now, with Olympic and Titanic, they started framing these ships from the stern forward. So, if it hadn't worked out, I think they'd have been in a fair bit of trouble, really. Um, so, one of the engineers at the time and um, this is someone that reported to Cunard, he was um, very concerned. He said, well, if you've got a three-propeller ship, um, the whole spacing of the propellers, the whole form of the ship at the stern, um, he said, if you don't get this right, it could completely wipe out the advantages of this new machinery. And um, there was an American naval constructor in 1907, and he was interviewed by the New York Times, and he said, well, it's possible to build a ship with three propellers, but he said to give it both re reciprocating and turbine engines will inevitably result in a failure as marked as that of the Great Eastern half a century ago. So the Great Eastern was um, widely um, understood as a, as a disaster, really. Um, a huge ship was just not financially viable. Um, so you've got experienced people in 1907 who was just saying actually we've got real doubts that this is going to work and there were people that were prophesying disaster um, and uh, as Aidan alluded to in his introduction um, we've got Olympic here on the left you can see that the uh, propelling machinery develops about 59,000 horsepower and then you've got the four ships uh, Celtic, Cedric, Baltic and Adriatic, you add them up together, these four ships, all of, the, all of them together, all of their engines, are not as powerful as Olympic on her own. So it, it just shows you um, the, uh, the, the scale of the, uh, of the challenge, really. Um, so just, yeah, just wider context, you can see all the, uh, all the boilers there as well that were needed to uh, generate the steam to power these engines. And um, actually, although it was quirky, although it was an unusual um, combination of uh, machinery, although I think Holland and Wolf went on to build maybe 20 ships um, with this uh, combination, um, actually they were more economical than Lusitania and Mauritania. So if you do a comparison of coal consumed per horsepower to, you know, to, to make allowance for the fact that the Cunard ships were more powerful, um, Olympic burned 1.4 pounds of coal per horsepower per hour, whereas it was 1.43 for the Cunarders. So she was just a bit more economical. And um, these engines, um, the reciprocating engines, they were tried and tested really. They, they weren't on them over as of themselves revolutionary, um, but uh, they, uh, they did their job and uh, 
We've got data for about 90% of Olympics voyages and she averaged 21.5 knots. Um, that's westbound and eastbound <coughs> on the Atlantic in all weathers. You've got very stormy winter crossings. So designed for 21 and she easily does 21 and a half over a quarter of a century. So um, this um, design that they used turned out to be really good, really effective and uh, it did its job uh, basically. And um, they were very impressive engines to look at. If you look at the Titanic wreck today, because of course the ship broke apart, you can see these massive two engines standing up. And um, I think the forward cylinders have broken off, but they're standing there intact, even as the hull of the ship has just disintegrated. So it's a remarkable sight to, to, to look at, really. Um, and uh, Edward Wilding, who was um, one of Holland and Wolf's technical staff, he said, I do not think that many people who have not been there realise the enormous power that there is got from the steam pressure in these engines. They move comparatively slowly even when at full power and the power behind them is, I think I'm correct in stating, larger than the power behind the biggest steel rolling mills in the world. And um, I'm told that these engines are still the largest triple expansion uh, reciprocating steam engines that were built for maritime use ever. Um, so, uh, so that's a, a record that they hold. Um, and after talking about all these challenges, you might start to wonder, well, was it really worth building them uh, this big? And um, at the end of 1911, there was a newspaper article. Um, this was after Britannic had been laid down. And it said that the White Star were building, were building with Holland and Wolf a ship that was a thousand feet long. Um, and Albert Ballin, who I mentioned earlier, who was head of the uh, German um, shipping company, uh, Hamburg America, wrote to Bruce Ismay of White Star. And Ballin said that he didn't think it paid to continue the race for the largest ship. Um, and uh, Ismay responded and he said, well actually we're not building a ship a thousand feet long, it's just a newspaper exaggeration. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what is particularly interesting is that Ismay then makes a proposal to uh, Albert Ballin. And Ismay says, I would welcome an understanding amongst leading shipping companies which would restrict competition for owning the largest ship. Feel strongly the only means of preventing unnecessary construction of huge vessels would be some arrangement of joint ownership. And then he says, we are considering building three additional steamers in order to run a semi-weekly service between Southampton and New York. Um, which is a really odd reference, really, because these three Olympic class ships were designed to run a weekly service uh, between Southampton and New York. Um, if you were considering building three more ships who are not specified, um, I don't know why you put that in a letter to one of your rivals, unless it's disinformation. Um, but you've got this remarkable um, instance, really, where in 1911, all of these shipping lines are building larger and larger ships. And at least in private correspondence, they're saying, well, is it really necessary? And for all their fierce rivalries, as with the insurance arrangement, where they put these big ships in a separate arrangement to the rest of their fleets, they're actually saying, well, should we have an arrangement of joint ownership where all of us will uh, own these uh, large ships? So that was just one of those things that um, uh, comes up in reading Ismay's correspondence. And it was certainly something that startled me when you hear about the rivalry between uh, these great shipping companies. Okie doke. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. <laughs>